Underlying tensions at Styles had come to the surface in a devastating way. Emily Inglethorpe was dead, died of an attack of choking late in the evening while the house was abed. The suspiciously ever-present Dr. Baustein seemed quite certain she had been poisoned, and the entire household was in shock. I was grateful to have enlisted my dear friend and esteemed detective, Monsieur Hercule Poirot, to investigate. I had assured John Cavendish that he would be the picture of discretion. Poirot and I had done a thorough examination of the dear deceased lady's quarters, making some jolly interesting discoveries, though where Poirot's mind was in the whole affair I couldn't say. His mind leapt from begonias to letters and wills to coffee cups. I think, mon ami, that next we should speak with the dear girl Annie. Yes, Annie the chambermaid should be our next interviewee. Then I shall return to my coffee cups. Poirot, before we go dashing off again... What is it, Hastings? Your forehead, it shows signs of a great puzzle within. How did you know that Mrs. Inglethorpe took sleeping powders? And about the lost key and the duplicate? One thing at a time. As to the sleeping powders, I knew by this. Good heavens, Poirot, that's a chemist's prescription box. Where on earth did you find that? In the washstand drawer in Mrs. Inglethorpe's bedroom. It was number six of my catalogue. But I suppose, as the last powder was taken two days ago, it is not of much importance. Yeah, probably not. But do you notice anything that strikes you as peculiar about this box? No, I, I can't say that I do. Look at the label. One powder to be taken at bedtime if required. Mrs. Inglethorpe. No, I see nothing unusual. Not the fact that there is no chemist's name? I'll be damned. To be sure, that is odd. Praises and more. Have you never known a chemist to send out a box like that Without his printed name? No. No, I can't say I have. So do you think that someone, say, Alfred Inglethorpe, could have left this box? Uh, let us not put the horse before the cart, Hastings. The explanation is quite simple. So do not intrigue yourself, my friend. Sirs, Dorcas sent me to see you. Ah, yes, I sent for you, Annie, because I thought you might be able to tell me something about the letters Mrs. Inglethorpe wrote last night. How many were there? And can you tell me any of the names and addresses? There were four letters, sir. One was to Miss Howard, and one was to Mr. Wells, the lawyer, and the other two, I don't think I can remember, sir. Oh, yes, one was to Ross's, the caterers in Tadminster. The other one I don't remember. I think. I'm sorry, sir, but it's clean gone. I don't think I could have noticed it. No matter. Now, I want to ask you about something else. There is a saucepan in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room with some cocoa in it. Did she have that every night? Well, yes, sir. I was to put it in her room every evening, and she warmed it up at night whenever she fancied it. it what was it? Uh, the plain cocoa? Yes, sir. Made with milk, with a teaspoonful of sugar, and two teaspoonfuls of rum in it. Who took it to her room? I did, sir. Always? Yes, sir. At what time? When I went to draw the curtains, as a rule, sir. Did you bring it straight up from the kitchen, then? No, sir. You see, there's not much room on the gas stove, so Cook used to make it early before putting the vegetables on for supper. Then I used to bring it up and put it on the table by the swing door and take it into a room later. The swing door is in the left wing, is it not? Yes, sir. And the table, is it on this side of the door or on the father servant's side? It's this side, sir. What time did you bring it up last night? About quarter past seven, I should say, sir. And when did you take it into Mrs. Inglethorpe's room? When I went to shut up, sir. About eight o'clock. Miss Inglethorpe came up to bed before I'd finished. 
Then, between 7.15 and 8 o'clock, the Coco was standing on the table in the left wing? Yes, sir. And if there was salt in it, it wasn't me. I never took salt near it. What makes you think there was salt in it? Seen it on the tray, sir. You saw some salt on the tray? Yes. Uh, coarse kitchen salt, it looked like. I never noticed it when I took the tray up, but when I came to take it to the mistress's room, I saw it at once, and I suppose I ought to have taken it down again and asked Cook to make some fresh, but, but I was in a hurry because Dorcas was out, and I thought maybe the cocoa was just all right, and the salt had just gone on the tray. So I, I dusted it off with my apron and took it in. Ha! I knew it was in the cocoa! We will speak more of that later, Hastings. One moment. Mademoiselle Annie, when you went into Mrs. Inglethorpe's room, was the door leading into Miss Cynthia's room bolted? Oh, uh, yes, sir. It always was. It had never been opened. And the door into Mr. Inglethorpe's room? Did you notice if that was bolted too? I couldn't rightly say, sir. It was shut, but I couldn't say whether it was bolted or not. When you finally left the room, did Mrs. Inglethorpe bolt the door after you? Uh, No, sir, not then. But I expected she did later. She usually did lock it at night. The door into the passage, that is. Did you notice any candle grease on the floor when you did the room yesterday? Candle grease? Uh, No, sir. Mrs. Inglethorpe didn't have a candle, only a reading lamp. Then, if there had been a large patch of candle grease on the floor, you think you would have been sure to have seen it? Well, yes, sir, and I would have taken it out with a piece of blotting paper and an odd iron. Did your mistress ever have a green dress? No, sir. Nor a mantle, nor a cape, nor a, uh, how you call it, a sports coat? Not green, sir. Nor anyone else in the house? No, sir. You are sure of that? Quite sure. Yeah, then this is all I want to know. Thank you very much. Might I be excused, sir? But of course. Thank you. This was most helpful. Thank you, sir. Poirot, I congratulate you. This is a great discovery indeed. What is a great discovery? Why, that it was the cocoa and not the coffee that was poisoned. That explains everything. Of course it did not take effect until the early morning, since the cocoa was only drunk in the middle of the night. So you think that the cocoa... (laughs) Mark well what I say, Hastings. The cocoa contains strychnine? Of course. That salt on the tray, what else could it have been? It might have been salt. But it couldn't be. Honestly, Poirot... Oh, you are not pleased with me, mon ami? My dear Poirot, it is not for me to dictate to you. You have the right to your own opinion just as I have to mine. The boudoir of the Mr. Alfred Inglethorpe did not yield much, though he is a man of method, which I greatly admire. Oh, and this. But that's Emily Inglethorpe's handwriting. I am possessed. He is possessed. Possessed, possessed. Wherever did you find this? In the waste paper basket. What does it mean? I cannot say. But it is suggestive, no? Was it possible that Mrs. Inglethorpe's mind was deranged? Had she some fantastic idea of demonical possession? And if that was so, was it not also possible that she might have taken her own life? <laughs> oh, mon ami, what an imagination you have. Come now to examine the coffee cups. My dear Poro, what on earth is the good of that, now that we know about the cocoa? Ooh la la, that miserable cocoa. And anyway, as Mrs. Inglethorpe took her coffee upstairs with her, I don't see what you expect to find. Unless you consider it likely that we shall discover a pack of strychnine on the coffee tray. Come, come, my friend. Naval Vashepa, uh, allow me to interest myself in my coffee cups, and I will respect your cocoa. 
Hvad? Ind til tilbakken? <laughs> Very well, Poirot. Now, let us review exactly where each person was in relation to each cup. So, Mrs. Cavendish stood by the tray and poured out. Yes. Then she came across to the window where you sat with Mademoiselle Cynthia. Yes. Here are the three cups. And the cup on the mantelpiece, half drunk, that would be Mr. Lawrence Cavendish's. And the one on the tray? Uh, John Cavendish's. I saw him put it down there. Good. One, two, three, four, five. But where then is the cup of Mr. Inglethorpe? Well, he does not take coffee. Then all are accounted for. One moment, my friend. I just need to take a drop or two from each and put them in these test tubes so we can test as we go. Yeah, it is evident. I had an idea, but clearly I was mistaken. Yes, altogether I was mistaken. Yet, it is strange. But no matter. <clears throat> Excuse me, gentlemen. Breakfast is served downstairs. Uh, Monsieur Poirot, Mr. Cavendish wanted to extend an invitation for you to join us. Ah, oh, thank you, Dorcas. I would be delighted. Come, Hastings. As Poirot and I descended the stairs, I couldn't help but wonder in what state I would find each member of the family. Lawrence was often closed off, and Mary Cavendish was as enigmatic as the Mona Lisa herself. And then there was the young and vibrant Cynthia. John Cavendish greeted Poirot and me before we could enter the dining room proper. I noted, with surprise, that he appeared to have made almost a full return to his former self. Morning all, uh, Monsieur Poirot, so glad you can join us. Can I have just a quick word before we dine? But of course. Certainly. I've been up since the crack of dawn trying to make sure I sent telegrams to all and sundry. And of course notify the papers of the event. Evie should be back later today though, which will be good. May I ask how things are proceeding on your end? Do your investigations point to my mother having died a natural death or... Or must we prepare ourselves for the worst? I think, Mr. Cavendish, that you would do well not to buoy yourself up with any false hopes. Can you tell me the views of the other members of the family? My brother Lawrence has become convinced that we are making a fuss over nothing. He says that everything points to it being a simple case of heart failure. He does, does he? Oh, that is very interesting. Very interesting. And Mrs. Cavendish? Hmm. <laughs> I have not the least idea what my wife's views on the subject are. I told you, didn't I, that Mr. Inglethorpe has returned. It's a dashed awkward position for all of us. Of course, one has to treat him as usual. But hang it all, one's gorge does rise at sitting down to eat with a possible murderer. I, I quite understand. It is a very difficult situation for you, Mr. Cavendish. I would like to ask you one question. Mr. Inglethorpe's reason for not returning last night was, I believe, that he had forgotten the latch key. Is not that so? Yes. I suppose you are quite sure that the latch key was forgotten? That he did not take it after all? I have no idea. I never thought of looking. We always keep it in the hall drawer. I'll go and see if it's there now. No, oh, no, 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 Mr. Cavendish, it is too late now. I am certain that you would find it. If Mr. Inglethorpe did take it, he has had ample time to replace it by now. But do you think that... I think nothing. If anyone had chanced to look this morning before his return and seen it there, it would have been a valuable point in his favour. That is all. Do not worry. I assure you that you need not let it trouble you. Now, let us go and have some breakfast. As we entered the dining room, I observed the family. As Poirot had predicted, 
Despite the somber appearance, there was not much evidence of reddened eyes or deeper grief. Except for Alfred Inglethorpe, who played his role of grieving widow to a T. I just can't believe it. I keep listening for her step on the stair, for her to come through the door, for her to speak my name again. I'm sure it would take some time to get used to. Oh, good morning, Hastings. Monsieur Poirot. It was just all so sudden. So very sudden. I say, Cynthia, are you feeling all right? Y you look awfully drawn. Yes. I've got the most beastly headache. Have another cup of coffee, mademoiselle. It will revive you. It is unparalleled for the mal de tête. It, allow me to fill your cup. Oh, thank you. No sugar, please. No sugar? You abandon it in wartime, eh? No, I never take it in coffee. <sighs> Sacré! Why, Monsieur Poirot, you look rather like the cat who got the cream. Your eyes are positively glowing. They're emerald green. Do tell us what you've discovered. Mary, you've been reading too many romantic novels. I'm sure Monsieur Poirot is as nonplussed as we are as to why we even have to have an inquest. It was quite clearly a simple heart seizure. Lawrence, the inquest is unavoidable. It will be tomorrow and then we will know. Dr. Bowerstein is quite convinced there was foul play, and he has to give the coroner his reasons for his suspicion. Dr. Bowerstein is a poison specialist. I'm sure he looks for his specialty in every situation. More chance for him to be a star. Lawrence, the doctor could not be any further from a game grabber. He is a true gentleman of integrity and intellect. Forgive me, my dearest sister-in-law. I defer to your obvious expertise on the subject, given how much time you spend with the man. Lawrence, that's enough. I just can't bear to think that anyone could think to hurt my wife. She was an angel. You know yourself, Monsieur Poirot, as you have experienced the benefits of her generosity firsthand. Absoluma, a lady of the first rate. At least you weren't here to experience it firsthand, Alfred. It was rather disturbing. It was awful. I still can't stop thinking I could have done something, anything. I just feel useless. Be kind to yourself, Cynthia. None of us could have seen it coming. Miss Howard did. She said... Speaking of... Miss Howard should be returning to Styles this afternoon, so she will be able to give us all her opinions in person. How wonderful. I would be careful listening to her. She is not a stable woman. I know we are kin, but she has been so harsh and unforgiving lately, making the most outlandish accusations. Excuse the interruption, sir. Mr. Wells is here to see you. Thank you, Dorcas. Show him to my study, will you? Excuse us all. Uh, Monsieur Poirot, he is my mother's lawyer. He's also coroner. Would you care to join us? I would like that very much. Mademoiselle Cynthia, may I have a brief word with you? Perhaps in the hallway? Dorcas, could you be so kind as to check on the items in this note for me? Yes, sir. Of course. Mademoiselle Cynthia, I have for you but the briefest of questions, and then you may rest that troublesome head of yours. Oh, I'll be fine, Monsieur Poirot. Please, ask away. Did you ever make up Mrs. Inglethorpe's medicines? No. Only her powders? Oh, yes. I did make up some sleeping powders for her once. These? I, I found them in Miss Inglethorpe's room. Yes. Uh, can you tell me what they were? Sulfonol? Veronol? No, they were bromide powders. Ah, thank you, mademoiselle. Allow me to trouble you no longer. Have a good morning. Poor girl. 
She is taking this hard. Hmm. Hmm. What is it? You are not attending to what I say. It is true, my friend. I, I am much worried. Why? Because Mademoiselle Cynthia does not take sugar in her coffee. What? Poro, you cannot be serious. But I am most serious. Oh, there is something there that I do not understand. My instinct was right. What instinct? The instinct that led me to insist on examining those coffee cups. Oh, shoot. Uh, uh, no more now. Uh, I must join Mr. John Cavendish and his solicitor. As I was about to follow Poirot into the study, I felt a light hand on my arm. I turned to find the sphinx-like smile of Mary Cavendish. Why, what has happened to your extraordinary little friend, Mr. Hastings? He has just rushed away like a mad bull. He's rather upset about... something. Well, how restful are you finding this recuperative stay at Styles, Mr. Hastings? Well, it's certainly not the most relaxing stay, but it certainly beats the convalescent home. People are rather fascinating, I think. Especially families. So much under the surface. I'm worried about what will happen when she comes back and they're in the same house. Who? Mr. Inglethorpe and Miss Howard. Do you think it would be such a disaster, really? Well, don't you? No. I should like to see a good flare-up. It would clear the air. At present, we are all thinking so much and saying so little. John doesn't think so. He's anxious to keep them apart. Oh, John. Old John's an awfully good sort. You are loyal to your friend. I like you for that. But well, aren't you my friend, too? I am a very bad friend. Why do you say that? Because it is true. I am charming to my friends one day, and forget all about them the next. Yet you seem to be invariably charming to Dr. Bowerstein. I don't know what you mean. Excuse me, please. Dash it all. I don't know what possessed me to blurt that out. It wasn't really any of my business, but she was so removed, so disdainful of her husband, and, and so enamored of that bearded quack... It really had got my goat. As I watched her walk, stiff-backed up the stairs, I was taken again by the extreme control of personality that a woman exerted. Quite tremendous. I shook my head and headed to the study to meet Poirot. I walked into the study to find John and Poirot in deep conversation with a scholarly-looking man of middle age, the solicitor, Mr. Wells. You will understand, Wells, that this is all strictly private. We are still hoping that there will turn out to be no need for investigation of any kind. Quite so, quite so. I wish we could have spared you the pain and publicity of an inquest, but of course it's quite unavoidable in the absence of a doctor's certificate. Yes, I suppose so. Clever man, Bowerstein. Great authority on toxicology, I believe. Indeed. Shall we have to appear as witnesses? All of us, I mean. You, of course, and uh, uh, Mr. <coughs> Inglethorpe. Uh, any other evidence will be simply confirmatory, a mere matter of form. I see. <laughs> That's wonderful. The post-mortem is to take place tonight, I believe. Yes. I need not tell you, my dear Cavendish, how distressed I am at this most tragic affair. Can you give us no help in solving it? Me? Yes, we heard that Mrs. Inglethorpe wrote to you last night. You should have received the letter this morning. I did, but it contains no information. It is merely a note asking me to call upon her this morning, as she wanted my advice on a matter of great importance. She gave you no hint as to what that matter might be? No, unfortunately, no. A great pity. Mr. Wells, there is one thing I should like to ask you. That is, if it is not against professional etiquette. In the event of Mrs. Inglethorpe's death... 
Who would inherit her money? The knowledge will be public property very soon, so if Mr. Cavendish does not object... Not at all. I do not see any reason why I should not answer your question. By her last will, dated August of last year, after various unimportant legacies to servants, etc., she gave her entire fortune to her stepson, Mr. John Cavendish. Pardon the question, Mr. Cavendish. A rather unfair to her other stepson, Mr. Lawrence Cavendish? No, I do not think so. You see, under the terms of their father's will, while John inherited the property, Lawrence, at his stepmother's death, would come into a considerable sum of money. Hmm. I see. But I am right in saying, am I not, that by your English law that will was automatically revoked when Mrs. Inglethorpe remarried? You are correct, Monsieur Perrault. That document is now null and void. Was Mrs. Inglethorpe herself aware of that fact? I do not know. She may have been. She was. We were discussing the matter of wills being revoked by marriage only yesterday. Ah! One more question, Mr. Wells. Uh, you say her last will. Had Mrs. Inglethorpe then made several former wills? <laughs> On an average, she made a new will at least once a year. She was given to changing her mind as to her testamentary dispositions, now benefiting one, now another member of the family. Suppose that, unknown to you, she had made a new will in favour of someone who was not, in any sense of the word, a member of the family. We will say Miss Howard, for instance. Would you be surprised? Not in the least. Ah. Poro, you don't think... No. Uh, but why then... Hush! But then why... We are going through my stepmother's papers. Mr. Inglethorpe is quite willing to leave it entirely to Mr. Wells and myself. Which simplifies matters very much, as technically, of course, he was entitled to... We will look through the desk in the boudoir first, and go up to her bedroom afterwards. She kept her most important papers in a purple despatch case, which we must look through carefully. Yes, it is quite possible that there may be a later will than the one in my possession. There is a later will. What? Pardon? Or, there was one. What do you mean, there was one? Where is it now? Bert, see here. Hastings and I found this tiny scrap yesterday when I was going through the room. But possibly this is an old will? I do not think so. In fact, I am almost certain that it was made no earlier than yesterday afternoon. What? Impossible. I sent the good Dorcas on a mission to make some inquiries for me. Let us summon her and hear her report. Very well. Dorcas, did you have the opportunity to ask the gardener the questions I supplied? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Manning, that's her gardener, reported that he and the boy William were planting begonias when Miss Emily leaned out the window and sent William on an errand to the village to fetch her a form of will. He went on his bicycle. Some time later, both William and Manning were summoned to Miss Emily's chamber to sign a document that was hidden under blotting paper. She then placed this paper in a long envelope and put it inside a purplish blue box that was on her desk. Excellent, Dorcas. And did Manning speak to the time? He did, sir. He said it was right after 4 p.m. Thank you, Dorcas. That will be all. Good heavens, what an extraordinary coincidence. How a coincidence? That my stepmother should have made a will on the very day of her death? Uh, are you so sure it is a coincidence, Cavendish? What do you mean? Your stepmother, you tell me, had a violent quarrel with someone yesterday afternoon. In consequence of that quarrel, your mother very suddenly and hurriedly makes a new will. The contents of that will we shall never know. She told no one of its provisions. But this morning, no doubt, she would have consulted me in the subject, but she had no chance. The will disappears, and she takes its secret with her to her grave. Cavendish, I much fear there is no coincidence here. Monsieur Poirot, I am sure you agree with me that the facts are very suggestive. 
Suggestive or not, we are most grateful to Monsieur Poirot for elucidating the matter. But for him, we should never have known of this will. I suppose I may not ask you, Monsieur, what first led you to suspect the fact? A scribbled over old envelope and a freshly planted bed of begonias. Evie! Excuse me, Wells. As Poirot and I followed John into the hall and I laid eyes on Evelyn Howard again, I was struck by a pang of guilt. She had charged me specifically with protecting Emily Inglethorpe, and I had failed. I was relieved she was as hale and hearty as ever, despite eyes rimmed with red from recent tears. Start of the moment I got the wire. Just come off night duty, hired a car. Quickest way to get here. Have you had anything to eat this morning, Evie? No. I thought not. Come along, breakfast not yet cleared away, and they'll make you some fresh tea. Look after her, Hastings, will you? Wells is waiting for me. Oh, here's Monsieur Poirot. He's helping us, you know, Evie. Oh, nice to meet you, Monsieur Poirot. What do you mean, helping us? Helping us to investigate. Nothing to investigate. Have they taken him to prison yet? Taken who to prison? Who? Alfred Inglethorpe, of course. My dear Evie, do be careful. Lawrence is of the opinion that my stepmother died from heart seizure. More fool, Lawrence. Of course Alfred Inglethorpe murdered poor Emily, as I always told you he would. My dear Evie, don't shout so. Whatever we may think or suspect, it is better to say as little as possible for the present. Not to do fiddlesticks! You're all off your heads! The man will be out of the country by then, if he's any sense. He won't stay here tamely and wait to be hanged. Oh, I know what it is. You've been listening to the doctors. Never should. What do they know? Nothing at all, or just enough to make them dangerous. Well, I ought to know. My own father was a doctor. Heart seizure. Ha! Sort of thing he would say. Anyone with any sense could see at once that her husband had poisoned her. I always said he'd murdered her in her bed, poor soul. Now he's done it. And all you can do is to murmur silly things about heart seizure and inquest on Friday. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, John Cavendish. What do you want me to do? Dash it all, Evie. I can't haul him down to the local police station by the scruff of his neck. Well, you might do something. Find out how he did it. He's a crafty beggar. Dare say he soaked fly papers. Ask Cook if she's missed any. Uh, Mademoiselle, I want to ask you something. Ask away. I want to be able to count upon your help. I'll help you to hang Alfred with pleasure. Actually, hanging is too good for him. Ought to be drawn and quartered like in the good old times. We are as one then, for I too want to hang the criminal. Alfred Inglethorpe. Him? Or another? No! No question of another. Poor Emily was never murdered until he came along. Well, I don't say she wasn't surrounded by sharks. She was. But it was only her purse they were after. Her life was safe enough. But along comes Mr. Alfred Inglethorpe, and within two months, ha! Presto! Believe me, Miss Howard, if Mr. Inglethorpe is the man, he shall not escape me. On my honour, I will hang him as high as Haman. That's better! But I must ask you to trust me. Now, your help may be very valuable to me. I will tell you why. Because in all this house of mourning, yours are the only eyes that have wept. And if you mean that I was fond of her, yes, I was. You know, Emily was a selfish old woman in her way. She was very generous, but she always wanted a return. She never let people forget what she had done for them. And that way, she missed love. Don't think she ever realized it, though, or felt the lack of it. I hope not, anyway. I was on a different footing. I took my stand from the first. So many pounds a year I'm worth to you, well and good, but not a penny piece besides, not a pair of gloves, nor a theatre ticket. Well, she didn't understand, was very offended sometimes, said I was foolishly proud. It wasn't that. But I couldn't explain. Anyway, I kept my self-respect. 
and so out of the whole bunch, I was the only one who could allow myself to be fond of her. I watched over her. I guarded her from the lot of them. And then a glib-tongued scoundrel comes along, and poof, all my years of devotion go for nothing. I understand, mademoiselle. I understand all you feel. It is most natural. You think that we are lukewarm, that we lack fire and energy. But trust me, it is not so. Shall we adjourn to the mater's boudoir? We can check that chest. Evie, I shall see you later. Help yourself to food. You're too good to me, John. Gentlemen. Monsieur Poirot, I believe you have the keys? Assuredly. My mother kept most of her important papers in this despatch case, I believe. Ah, permit me, I locked it out of precaution this morning. But it's not locked now. Impossible! See, si. oh, Me, Tonnel, and I, who have bought the keys in my pocket, if we allow an affair, this lock has been forced! What? What? But who forced it? Why should they? When? But, but the, the door, door was locked. locked. Who? That is the question. Why? Ah, if only I knew. When? Since I was here an hour ago. As to the door being locked, it is a very ordinary lock. Probably any other. The door keys in this passage would fit it. It was like this. There was something in that case. Some piece of evidence. Slight in itself, perhaps. But still enough of a clue to connect the murder with the crime. It was vital to him that it should be destroyed before it was discovered and its significance appreciated. Therefore, he took the risk, the great risk of coming in here. Finding the case locked, he was obliged to force it, thus betraying his presence. For him to take that risk, it must have been something of great importance. But what was it? <gasps> that I do not know! A document of some kind, without doubt. Possibly a scrap of paper Dorcas saw in her hand yesterday afternoon. And I, miserable animal that I am, I guessed nothing. I have behaved like an imbecile. My little grey cells have been disordered. I should never have left that case here. I should have carried it away with me. Ah, how could I be so foolish? Easy there, old chappy. It's not as bad as all that. Ah, Hastings, but now the hunt is on. The murderer thinks to trick the Cure Poirot. But now I will be redoubling my efforts. He does not stand a chance. No, he does not stand a chance. And with that emphatic, if enigmatic, proclamation, his temper disappeared as fast as it had come and was replaced with a steely resolve. I could only hope he was right. Thank you for listening to Murder in Your Ear. We appreciate you. To receive access to specialized content and to continue to support our quality programming, we invite you to visit our brand new Patreon site at www.patreon.com forward slash murder in your ear. That's www.patreon.com forward slash murder in your ear. And as always, Find us on Facebook and Instagram at NRM Performance and Twitter at Murder Ear. <laughs>